We started our day in a bomb shelter in Nariya. I asked the kids, do you know Hezbollah? They want to kill us, 11-year-old Tal says. His sister Michal feels safe here. But as we left, panic, new rocket attacks all around us. Katyushas, she shouts, bombs. Where are my children, she cries. A man points to the smoke and we run there, half a mile past another bomb shelter. More frightened people pointing the way. When we get there, cars are destroyed, gasoline flowing down the street, burning embers. Live electric cables on the ground, water mains broken, deadly combinations. The Katusha rocket with its 50-pound warhead made only a small hole in the ground, but spread terror. A man is in shock. Then close by a second rocket, but nobody was wounded either time. The house here has been, has been hit by a rocket, but everybody was inside the bomb shelter here. And then a third rocket. Terror on the home front. We run another half a mile. A quick response can save lives, but for all three bombs, we got there before the ambulances. This man had no chance, a direct hit. They're just waiting for the ambulance to arrive, yet again, right next to a bomb shelter. Most people are inside, and that's how they stayed safe. But this man clearly was in the wrong place at the wrong time. At the shelter, this lady is desperate. Where are you? Where are you? She cries. The man explains she's lost her husband. The woman tries to call him. Then everyone hears a phone ring. It's by the dead body. We first met them six months ago, two mothers living with fear and anger. In Ramallah, the Palestinian 42-year-old Najwa Sade. How do you feel about being here? I mean, this is Arafat's under siege here. You've got the tanks over here. You're smelling the tear gas right now. Humiliated, uh, Martin. I feel humiliated here. I feel that uh, I'm a prisoner in my own country. And 10 miles away in Jerusalem, the Israeli 40-year-old Edit Shema, living in constant fear her children could be killed by a suicide bomber. And while we were with her, suddenly the news, a bomb had just exploded by the school gate. Don't leave school, stay inside, she desperately tells her children. I'm worried when they go out, I ask them to call me every time. Two mothers divided by their people's hate. Then finally, Edit asked why. Over the internet, she wanted to know how the Palestinians could justify killing Israeli civilians. I got many responses. Most of them were very angry. But then came a message from a woman in Ramallah. It was Najwa. She made me understand better the despair. And against the odds, Najwa and Edith became friends on the internet. For months, their concern for each other grew, softening a little the pain around them. I'm really worried about you. Let me know you and your children are OK. A glimmer of hope in the toughest of times. Then the two women decided they wanted a meet. But there was always a bomb or a killing. So finally, NBC News offered to bring them together. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah. You look different than oh. I imagined. How did you imagine me? You look beautiful. Thank you. Me too. Are you nervous? Yeah. yeah. I was. No, I'm not anymore. They were both filled with hope. <laughs> I think there can be peace, but uh, peace needs a lot of time and uh, peace needs uh, the world to understand. That was six months ago, two enemies who became friends, hoping their story could become the story of their peoples. But it didn't. There would be no peace. Instead, the violence only got worse. This week, we went back to check on the two friends. For the last seven weeks, Najwa's family in Ramallah has lived under an Israeli curfew. 
her children helpless as Israeli tanks patrol the streets they want to play in. What they see is very bad, you know. They see soldiers all around us all the time that are uh, preventing them from living a normal life. And Adit more frightened than ever while Jerusalem is torn apart by the suicide bombers. Hope, hope sounds ridiculous now. And we learnt they had stopped meeting and talking with each other. Anger had taken the place of hope. I think we don't have much to say anymore. I'm frustrated and angry. I'm, I've been experiencing anger that I have never felt before. I don't know what I can say to her. I do realize that life must be hell for them, but I don't think it justifies killing innocent people on, on buses. Two mothers who tried to break the barriers of fear and hate. For a brief moment, they had a chance of friendship, but found that although war is not the answer, neither, it seems, is friendship, at least not for now. Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Jerusalem. What a journey, from the Holocaust to this workshop in Tel Aviv to Auschwitz. This violin is unique and not because of the music. That's not important to violin, the story. That's an unbelievable story. It's 1944. A 12-year-old boy called Motila, the sole survivor of a Nazi massacre, is hiding in a forest in the Ukraine. When resistance fighters find him, Motila is asleep and hugging this violin, and he wants revenge. When Amnon Weinstein got the violin, it was damaged and unplayable, but he reconstructed it and its story too. He found out that the boy began to play the violin for Nazi officers in their club. You see here, there is like a fingerprint. That's the boy's fingerprint? No, never ever. He was playing for drunk people. And the Germans are drinking schnapps and this is alcohol. And I do believe that maybe in one evening or something like that, one of the officers who was completely drunk grabbed the violin, give me, I will play also. Each time he played for them, Motter smuggled explosives into their club. Then one day... He put the fuse inside, he let it out, ran away, ran away, and it was a big explosion. 200 Germans killed and wounded. So that's, a, how to say, a revenge with the violin. A nice one. Later, the Germans killed Motila, but Amnon has his own kind of revenge. The violin plays on. In Jerusalem. And even in the death camp in Auschwitz. One of the world's great violinists, Shlomo Minsk, plays Motila's violin. Amnon was there. Everybody was crying. How was it for you in Auschwitz when he played Horido? This was really a moment that I will never forget all my life, and for two months I could not sleep after. Amnon thought of Motila and of his own family killed in the Holocaust, and he said, the Nazis are gone, but we're still here. For today, Martin Fletcher, NBC News, Tel Aviv.